So, welcome back to our series of uh, great antitrust lawyer uh, done by Concurrence. Uh, we are very uh, happy and proud to have you, uh, Ganangs, today. Uh, so, Ganang, you have a quite exceptional career in antitrust. Thank you. We start about the same time, maybe lo practicing law and That's studying. Right. Uh, you have been studying uh, abroad yeah. uh, in um, Great Britain, Turkey, yeah. and other country, Harvard, I yes. believe. Yes. And you've been practicing law with various law firms, and then you found out at the Ali Gürkanak law firm in Turkey. That's correct. You are now one of the leading, the leading, I would say, uh, Turkish uh, antitrust law firm. Thank you. And we are very happy to have you today to this uh, interview. This interview. Thank you. Very kind of you. I'm I'm truly honored to be chosen to this uh, this um, um, uh, yeah, panel. It's very interesting that uh, you know the great. Antitrust lawyers are being interviewed for in inspirational pieces that they want to pass on to younger uh, people. And I think uh, you're doing a wonderful thing. I'm happy to be a part of it. Exactly. It's exactly what we want to do, to pass the knowledge and the practice that you have gained and to share with uh, other, other lawyers. Yeah. So my first question, why, why do you want to pursue, to pursue a career as a lawyer? Why did you want to be a lawyer? Um, I, I think there are two answers to this. One is um, it's difficult for me to even understand why one wouldn't uh, mm -hmm. become a lawyer because mm -hmm. I've always find fairness and justice um, uh, as intrinsic uh, to who I am. Um, I, I'm not saying I'm the most fair or, or um, equitable person on earth, but uh, as a child too, mm -hmm. I've always looked into these matters as very, very important. And now I'm seeing that it's part of human nature. Um, I'm getting lectures from my son, Mehmet, who is seven years old, uh, about uh, justice and fairness daily. So um, it, it, I think it's, it's important. Uh, and some people just leave that mm -hmm. at that level. Some people just have a calling. My mm -hmm. calling was through my, my mom, who has one day given me a book called uh, The Courage of Their Convictions. Uh, this was a book by a writer called Peter um, Irons. Um, and the uh, year was 1990. I was a high school student, and I, uh, I loved the book. It was about the Supreme Court journey of uh, certain individuals and their, their call for fairness and, and justice, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and ever since I wanted to become a lawyer, then I uh, prepared for the university exam, went to Ankara uh, University Law School, then to Harvard Law School, and you know the story. Mm. Interesting. So I understand you are... Uh a lawyer with conviction. You're not only an antitrust lawyer uh, doing corporate and business mm. cases, but you have a, a deep interest in injustice, fairness. That is process. correct. That's correct. Mm. I I do take on cases uh, before the European Court of Human Rights. Okay. I do do a lot of fundamental rights cases as mm. well. Uh, freedom of speech issues uh, mm. are very close to the heart of what I do. Mm. Also, as we were discussing uh, earlier, uh, anti-corruption issues mm. and all that. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. So you've been studying, studying, studying in, uh, in Turkey, in, uh, in Great Britain, in the USA. What would you say today is missing in the teaching of law university? How would you reform the academia of mm. uh, teaching law? Mm. I think different things are missing in different parts of the world uh, mm -hmm. right now. So in Turkey, from a legal education perspective, what is missing is a true link between mm -hmm. what is really going on out there and what is being taught in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I think very few professors are actually taking daily life examples mm -hmm. uh, from what is actually at this point in time going on. Uh, rather, they're keeping it very theoretical, uh, and that is, this is leading the students to believe that it's quite detached mm -hmm. from the reality. Um, whereas in the U.S., uh, there is a wonderful link uh, mm -hmm. between uh, the uh, content and what is going on outside. Mm -hmm. What is missing in the U.S., in my view, is uh, the ability of uh, a uh, student to become what that student wants to become. Mm -hmm. If that student wants to uh, go into public service especially or uh, wants to do fundamental rights, civic rights uh, kind of work mm -hmm. because they're under very heavy student loans. Mm -hmm. uh, and the US system, unlike the Turkish system or the European system, mm -hmm. is imposing a lot of financial duties mm -hmm. on law, law school students, mm -hmm. uh, which then means that a lot of the people who would be more inspired doing fundamental rights work are converging into other fields of law just to make a, 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 an earning that would allow them mm -hmm. to pay back. 
in Europe, I think there's a more balanced approach. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that might be characterized as missing is there is sometimes uh, too much professing going mm -hmm. on. Um, so uh, you're French in, in France, that is, uh, in my view, uh, the case. In some schools in the UK, that's mm -hmm. my experience that that's the case. Pro there's nothing wrong with professing, mm -hmm. but I, I really like the approach in the US uh, that allows the student to probe uh, a matter and uh, learn by examining. Mm -hmm. uh, there is not enough of that in some schools in Europe, I find. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just um, brought down to um, someone claiming to know everything, mm -hmm. delivering uh, the knowledge mm -hmm. and the students taking down notes and, and uh, basically parroting that knowledge. Uh, that is a different mm -hmm. approach in the US, I believe. Yes, yes. Yeah. That was a European traditional approach. Yes. And now uh, we are moving more in a US where with more case, uh, so. ca cases and uh, university, more practical teaching by lawyers and judges. That's right. Uh, but so you, you start to study civil law or, and then business law. Yeah. How come you, you didn't have any teaching in competition in the Turkey, did no. you? So you had your first class, the competition was where? So uh, my first ever uh, class in mm -hmm. competition law was at Harvard. Mm -hmm. Years after I had started already doing competition law uh, in Turkey, mm. I hadn't seen any competition law because back in the day when I graduated, it was 1997, mm. there wasn't even the Turkish Competition Authority. Mm -hmm. uh, then the Turkish Competition Authority uh, was founded at the same time I was uh, uh, an M&A lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's when I started uh, doing more and more competition law work. At some stage, I realized that this is going to be a very interesting uh, field of law and the intersection between economics and law also mm -hmm. was very appealing to me. So when I went to Harvard Law School uh, in 2001, I, I have received my, my very first mm -hmm. uh, course on competition law from uh, Professor Louis Kaplo. Okay, Louis Kaplow, very good. Mm. So you got used teaching in the U.S. with uh, Louis Kaplow, and then you go back, you go to pra private practice doing M&A. When was the first competition case you had to deal with? So the first competition co case I had to deal with in uh, um, uh, overall was in Turkey in 1997, 98, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, way before I went to Harvard and all that. It was a uh, case uh, on what was then called uh, Kraft Jakob Zuchard, mm -hmm. um, and uh, on top of Kraft, there was uh, Ben Kisser and uh, uh, Procter and Gamble and what have you. One of the very first uh, investigations of the Turkish Competition Authority. I was uh, in the team defending uh, Kraft. Mm -hmm. This was a collective exclusionary conduct mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. a case. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that was my very first. Then I have done a lot of merger control work mm -hmm. already between '97 and 2000. Uh, and a lot of uh, other investigation work in competition mm -hmm. law fields, then went to Harvard. Mm -hmm. uh, my first global case uh, was when I moved to Brussels for the Microsoft case. Mm. Okay. And what was, so you, you've tried, you've trialed, and you've done a lot of cases, mergers, and uh, dominance, uh, cartels. Yeah. What, would be, what would you say would be the most difficult case you ever had in competition law? The most difficult case I ever had in competition law must have been my, the Microsoft mm -hmm. case because I wasn't then entirely used to uh, bridging the approaches between the EU and the US. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. it comes as a, as a reflex to me and I understand uh, how uh, counsel in each jurisdiction think. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's more convergence too today. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the day when I was doing the, uh, the Microsoft case with uh, Ian Forrester, uh, well, assisting Ian mm -hmm. Forrester do the case, I mm -hmm. should say, mm -hmm. um, I um, was feeling quite puzzled that the U.S. counsel involved would know the technology so well mm. and the U.S. antitrust law so well, but the EU law so mm. little. And the EU lawyers, uh, so Jean-Francois Belis and Ian Forrester, mm. um, um, and Jean-Francois was being assisted by Tim Castens, mm. uh, and I was assisting Ian Forrester, uh, they had very little appreciation of uh, the technology. Mm. And knowing the technology wasn't uh, a, a very natural thing for a mm. competition lawyer mm. back then. Right now, we all, I mean, knowing the market has always been a thing, but technology was a bit mystical back then. Mm. Now, we all engage in the details of the technology involved. Back in the day, uh, the reflex was always reducing it to 
the dynamics of another market that is more conceivable. And uh, it was quite a hustle to make sure that that the uh, interesting things about the technology itself was making heavy inroads into the defense. Uh, the U.S. Council tried to make sure of that, and that was quite a bit of a challenge. Uh, on top of the fact that I wasn't used to a Scottish accent of uh, Ian Forrester, so uh, I uh, well, and now I, you know, I know that it's not even a thick Scottish accent, but I was completely <laughs> underprepared for it. So wait for the yeah. true Scottish accent. Exactly. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So going back now to your career within the private practice, um, what would you say have been the highlights or the challenges of doing law in, in uh, this firm and all the firm mm-hmm. you've been working with? Mm-hmm. What would it be? I, I have felt that um, some cases have been very, very important mm-hmm. um, in terms of its total effect on the mm-hmm. society. Um, so um, some of the competition law cases that that I have been involved in mm. had that kind of an impact, like Microsoft uh, case, for example, mm. uh, um, has become uh, an important cornerstone of mm. how we enforce uh, a competition law in these mm-hmm. spheres. Um, uh, some of the cases that I have undertaken in the freedom of speech side were also equally important. Uh, right now, uh, Wikipedia is mm-hmm. access banned in Turkey, and I'm representing them uh, before the European Court of Human Rights. I find that to be a very important case. Uh, before uh, before the Turkish Com- uh, Constitutional Court, uh, I had done YouTube and Twitter cases. Mm-hmm. Those were very mm-hmm. close to my heart. Uh, other people were litigating as well in those cases. Um, and overall, I think going back to the competition law realm, mm. I would say that anything that was breaking new ground in mm. Turkey uh, was important for me because uh, it's very rare that you re- revisit mm. the same topic before, you know, four, three, five years. Mm. Uh, so it just becomes the lay of the land and, and uh, you move on. So mm. whenever there was a new precedent that was being made, I was particularly vigilant. Mm-hmm. And you've also been a member of boards for cooperation. Yes. What is it like to be a board member, a um, lawyer? I, I think, so I don't uh, generally become a board member to client. Well, I, I do not uh, become a, a, a board member to clients because I see a conflict of interest there. Uh, but I have been in the boards of a lot of associations mm-hmm. and uh, NGOs as well. Mm-hmm. It has taught me quite a quite a bit, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, especially, it has given me perspective, mm-hmm. um, like uh, being a part of Transparency International. It's mm-hmm. a good thing in terms of how you can look at a more holistic uh, um, uh, approach to increasing transparency mm-hmm. and the level playing field. Uh, the Turkish Industrialists and Business uh, Persons Association mm. uh, membership has given me a better understanding of how mm. uh, industry and commerce is mm. flowing in Turkey and what the sensitivities are. Mm. Uh, I have functioned in the B20, the mm. G20. Uh, that has given me a more international look, but still in a in an NGO perspective. Mm. I've, I've, I think I've uh, learned quite a quite a lot from mm. these exercises. So you've been working for corporation for NGOs. Have you ever think about joining the public service, mm. like joining the, uh, author, the competition Turkish authority. Mm. Have you ever think of this? So it is the dream, I think, of any um, you know good mm-hmm. uh, person, any patriotic person, which I uh, also define myself as, to go in and, and serve mm-hmm. uh, the country that directly, that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, uh, yet uh, we do not have the revolving door Uh, in Turkey the way Mm. they have it in the U.S., for Mm. example. So it's not very easy for a private attorney to, uh, for a few years, become a part of the competition Mm. authority, then go out and continue with the private practice again. In the U.S., I really envy how uh, it is intertwined and, Mm. and, uh, you know... uh, I think it's it, it does help a lot, uh, the given jurisdiction, uh, to make sure that both sides of the table are transparent to each other. Mm-hmm. In Turkey, you do see a competition authority 
uh, officials uh, sometimes leaving and uh, going into private practice, mm -hmm. but you don't see private practitioners mm. then being invited into the Turkish mm. Competition Authority. So once you go into yeah. the private zone, the, the Competition Authority perceives that that's the end of the story. Mm. And then, of course, there is uh, a two years uh, practice, um, uh, uh, no practice rule, mm. which means that after leaving the Turkish Competition Authority, you cannot practice for about uh, two years mm -hmm. um, in the competition law field. So mm -hmm. for a person like me, um, whose journey has been that after coming back to Turkey, mm -hmm. I have formed my law firm. Uh, this was never an option because too mm -hmm. many people were relying on me uh, to perform as an attorney. Um, mm -hmm. So I couldn't just do a, you know, one term gig at mm -hmm. the competition mm -hmm. authority mm -hmm. and, and then get out and wait for two mm -hmm. years and uh, go back to the private practice. Yeah, so no revolving door. No. There. Okay, no. I understand. So you just mentioned uh, Twitter, and you also mentioned Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. I have noticed that you have uh, quite a crowd following you on Twitter, so 80,000 yeah. people yeah. is more than the FTC or more than the ABA. How, yeah. how is it possible? Yeah, so I have uh, a lot of followers. Mm -hmm. It's true, I have about 80,000 uh, followers mm -hmm. uh, in Twitter. I think it's because um, in Turkey, young lawyers mm -hmm. want a... Uh, uh, a way of keeping in touch with how it is mm. done in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and generally, young people are a bit tired, I think, of redundant uh, local discussions mm -hmm. uh, that aren't universally uh, meaningful. Uh, so I think they, they like the fact that there is someone who is taking it to the universal level, mm -hmm. to the global level. Um, so, you know, this video of, of, of what mm. we're uh, discussing right now would be accessible to them mm. at some point in time. And there is someone out there that, that gets inspired by it, feeling, oh, okay, mm. so Ankara University Law School, this guy has gone there, graduated from it. Uh, you know, I don't have to do all at once. Mm. Uh, step by step by step, mm. uh, I could actually become a, a more global figure in, in mm. what I do. Mm. I mean, it's a huge honor uh, to be selected to this, uh, you know, a great antitrust uh, lawyer's uh, uh, speech. And I, I really thank you for it. Uh, but it's also an opportunity for me to signal mm. to younger lawyers in mm. Turkey that, you know, things, things do come along if, mm. they, if they keep on investing in themselves. Uh, that's, I think, feeding into how many people are following mm. me. A lot of them are not uh, competition law enthusiasts per se. Uh, and to the extent they become competition law enthusiasts, mm. it's, be it's because they feel that this is more a, mm. a universal field and it's easier to, mm. to be universal in this field. Mm. Uh, but they also want some inspiration and uh, mm. role modeling as well. And you're I providing think. this exactly. I, I'm doing. trying to. I'm hoping that I can. So what would be your advice to the young generation of students and of young lawyers? Um, I would say that uh, uh, the young generation of lawyers mm -hmm. should be watchful uh, of making sure that they're not always remaining in their in their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. uh, I woke up to this a little late, I, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, so I have uh, had all of my legal education at Ankara University mm -hmm. in a wonderful group of friends that were very much like me. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, way of thinking, how they approach life, uh, how they would react to a given debate and all that. Um, and I didn't make use of the opportunity to interact with people that would mm -hmm. make me uncomfortable with their thoughts or people that would be so different from me in mm -hmm. terms of uh, what they are bringing to the table uh, mm -hmm. when we're discussing something. I then continued to skip this opportunity when I was a junior lawyer uh, uh, in Istanbul, I think. Uh, the first point in time where I realized that this is really something that, that enriches you with Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr.'s uh, um, quote, it's a you know, mind that is stretching to new dimensions with a new idea, mm -hmm. never going back to its original dimensions. Mm -hmm. I've had that experience when I went to Harvard. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you have to go to Harvard uh, to have that kind of an experience. It was just that there were so many different people coming from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And because it was Harvard, I was feeling I should take something from everyone. Mm -hmm. So finally, I was 
uh, letting all these ideas in. I should have done that a lot earlier. So my uh, advice to my students at uh, mm. uh, law school in, uh, uh, in Turkey at Bilkent University always is uh, that they should not be too clicky and they should mm. uh, exchange ideas and leave their comfort zone. Uh, an Erasmus exchange mm. is a wonderful thing. Mm. Uh, an LLM is a wonderful thing. Going to a, a completely different culture and country and doing something for a while is a wonderful mm. thing. Um, so I generally advise them to to make themselves a bit more uncomfortable at that at that mm -hmm. age. Okay, let's turn on now about predictions. Uh, we have seen the law of competition uh, to evolve and change a lot in the last ten years. What would be your prediction for the future of competition law? Mm. I think competition law is also going to be impacted really heavily mm -hmm. by what really matters in the world r right now, which is climate and uh, environment and uh, the issue of sustainability. Mm -hmm. I think competition law will start taking more and more role onto itself mm. in that field of, uh, 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 of law uh, as well. Uh, not uh, hijacking competition law toward uh, those prime objectives mm -hmm. and policy preferences, but rather Uh, creating a competition law that is sensitive uh, to these issues mm -hmm. as well and trying to see uh, how competition law can be used in these fields. I think it's going to be quite important to note that it's already happening in the data protection arena. Mm -hmm. I'm not completely agreeing with what's happening. I'm talking about the Facebook case. Uh, I think the theory of harm in the Facebook case is too much of a data protection theory of harm and mm. too little of a uh, an antitrust theory of harm. Mm -hmm. But it is showing that uh, competition law is molding itself depending on what mm. the needs and urgencies are. Uh, my prediction is that uh, the climate change and the environment issues are going to be so effective in all of our lives in the near future mm. that competition law will not be immune to this and it will take on new duties in, in the field of sustainability especially. Very interesting. Nice prediction. We will see the coming year uh, if this is going to happen. Yeah. But it just is a very good uh, seat, seat way you. to see things evolve. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank thanks you. for uh, for the opportunity. Thank you.